Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. Twenty twenty has proven to be a stormy, contentious, and very difficult year. Many people are just happy to see this year come to an end. Of course, the overriding dominant theme of twenty twenty is the COVID nineteen pandemic, which actually began infecting America last December and then January, but which stopped life cold in America, in Israel, throughout the world in March of this year. And virtually everything that's happened of significance this year must be seen through the prism of COVID-19. And in many ways, this was a violent year. The Jewish year began with a march across the Brooklyn Bridge in solidarity with the Jews of Muncie, New York, and against anti-Semitism and hate after the vicious attack by a masked African-American with a machete broke into the home of a Hasidic rabbi during a Hanukkah celebration and slashed five participants, one critically, Joseph Newman, who died of his wounds three months later. In 2020, Israel remains extremely concerned about Iran's potential nuclear weapons capability, and many quietly applauded the U.S. killing the leader of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard, and terrorist mastermind Qasem Soleimani. Then in November, Iran's top nuclear scientist was also killed, with Iran accusing Israel of the assassination, though Israel has made no public statement. Also in November, the chief negotiator for the Palestinians, Saeb Erekat, died of COVID-19 after Israeli doctors at Hadassah Hospital fought for weeks to save the Palestinian leader's life. Also in January, Israel hosted the fifth International Holocaust Forum, which was attended by leaders of 45 different countries. 2020 was also a year of severe social turmoil in America, sparked in May by the brutal murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman, which sparked months of protests and some rioting in the streets of America, leading to curfews in many American cities as protesters sought an end to what many American Jews believe is systemic racism in our country. Black Lives Matter became the principal driver of the protests, though there are some Jews deeply troubled by the anti-Israel statements BLM has adopted in the past. Of course, it was a year of political turmoil in the state of Israel. In early March, Israelis went to the polls for a third time in a 12-month period to try to elect a parliament that could create a governing majority coalition of 61 or more seats in the 120-seat Knesset. According to form, the two parties that won the largest number of seats were Likud, with 36 seats, and blue and white with 33 seats. What followed was weeks and months of political maneuvering as politicians jockeyed for position and power in a coalition government. Also in March, ironically, the trial of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu began in a Jerusalem district court on charges of bribery, deceit, and breach of trust though due to the coronavirus, that trial was delayed. It was not until May, and in the midst of an ever-growing pandemic in Israel, that a unity government coalition of Likud and Blue and White, with Benny Gantz and Bibi Netanyahu agreeing that Mr. Netanyahu would serve as prime minister for the first year and a half, at which time he pledged to resign and leave public office, with General Benny Gantz becoming prime minister for the remaining two and a half years. The political scene was also stormy for the Jewish community in America. 
again in May with talk of the Netanyahu government extending sovereignty over parts of the West Bank and with the approval of the Trump administration, 191 Democratic members of the House of Representatives signed a letter opposing any Israeli attempt to extend sovereignty over parts of the West Bank, warning Prime Minister Netanyahu against taking steps that would, quote, fray our unique bonds, imperil Israel's future, and place out of reach the prospect of a lasting peace, unquote. And then in July, 13 Democratic senators similarly proposed an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that would restrict U.S. security to Israel if Israel extends sovereignty over parts of the West Bank by preventing Israel from utilizing U.S. funded equipment, including missile defense systems like the Iron Dome, to protect Jews living on the West Bank. Also in July, two Jewish figures in the public spotlight made big news. High-profile Jewish journalist Barry Weiss surprised everyone when she wrote a scathing letter of resignation to the New York Times, citing its bias, its unwillingness to represent the spectrum of American opinion, and of its bowing to the cancel culture. And longtime progressive Jewish activist Peter Beinart stunned the Jewish world by publishing a piece stating he no longer supports a two-state solution, but believes there should be a binational state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea that would replace the Jewish state of Israel. But there was at least a few moments of triumph and success worthy of honest celebration. In July, Israel successfully launched its OFEC-16 reconnaissance satellite, seen as extraordinary achievement for Israel's defense establishment and for the Israel aerospace industry. And on September 15th of this year, on the south lawn of the White House, the foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates and the Israeli prime minister flanked the president of the United States in an epic moment of world history. After years of being ridiculed by the media and by many inside the Jewish community, Donald Trump was party to the Abraham Accords, an historic peace agreement between the UAE and Bahrain and the State of Israel, which has prompted a host of other Muslim countries, such as Sudan and this month Morocco, to normalize relations with Israel, with others expected to follow including Saudi Arabia. Jared Kushner, David Friedman, Jason Greenblatt, and Avi Berkowitz worked tirelessly to achieve this peace breakthrough, one which many believe should now earn Donald Trump a Nobel Peace Prize. Of course, in November, Americans went to the polls to either re-elect President Donald Trump or replace him with Joe Biden. Once again, some 70% of American Jewry who tend to loathe Donald Trump voted for Joe Biden as the former vice president won a clear victory in both the electoral college and the popular vote to the dismay of many Jews and Israelis who believe Trump was a unique presidential friend of Israel who among other things had rejected the Iran nuclear deal a move that is widely supported by Israelis across the political spectrum. Many American Jews are also troubled by some of the choices of Joe Biden's appointments, which include Susan Rice, a strong critic of Israeli policy. Inside the Jewish community, while the overwhelming majority of Jews celebrate Donald Trump's defeat, the drama continues. And staying with elections, from January to March, AZM, the American Zionist movement, held seven weeks of online elections to send delegates to the 38th World Zionist Congress for a four-year term. 
JBS had the privilege of hosting three nights of election forums with representatives of the slates running for seats in the Congress. And more than 120,000 Zionists participated in the 2020 elections. And then this October, some 7,000 delegates from 35 different countries met for three days in a virtual conference. The biggest controversy at the Congress dealt with the battle between the right and left over influence and power, with the right ultimately making concessions to the left and the more liberal delegates of the Congress. And speaking of elections on the American Jewish scene, one of the most controversial votes inside American Jewry involved the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations, the umbrella organization of American Jewry with membership of more than 50 national Jewish organizations, where Diane Loeb, a former chairman of Hyas, won an unusually contested election to be the next lay chair of the conference. Members who opposed Loeb's selection argued that Hyas is no longer a Jewish organization and that Ms. Loeb has no real familiarity with the state of Israel. Current chair Arthur Stark proposed he would remain in the position for an extra year to give Diane Loeb the opportunity to become more familiar with the issues challenging the state of Israel. On the cultural scene at the Emmy Awards, Schitt's Creek won outstanding comedy series with actor Eugene Levy winning Best Lead Actor, and his son and co-creator of Schitt's Creek, Dan Levy, winning Best Supporting Actor, as well as winning Emmys for Best Writer, Best Director, and Best Producer. The first time one person has won in all four categories in a single year. Also, Julia Garner, whose mother is a Jewish Israeli, won her second Supporting Actress Emmy for her role in Ozark. At the Oscars, Teika Waititi, whose mother is Jewish, won an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for Jojo Rabbit. And at the Golden Globes, Sam Mendes, whose mother is Jewish, won Best Director for the film 1917, which also won for Best Picture. Also, the Jewish community lost, among many others, entertainment icons, Carl Reiner and Kirk Douglas. And among others whom the Jewish world lost this year were a number of rabbinic giants, including Adin Steinsaltz and Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, as well as losing a Supreme Court justice revered by many in the American Jewish community, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And on the cultural scene in December, the Jewish Book Council gave out its award for books written in 2019, with Pamela S. Nadell winning the Everett Family Foundation Jewish Book of the Year Award for her work entitled America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today. Other winners included Barry Weiss and Deborah Lipstadt, with Robert Alter receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award for his decades-long project, The Hebrew Bible, a translation with commentary. But perhaps the book of the year 2020 is Natan Sharansky's powerful memoir, which he's written with Gil Troy, describing his nine years in Soviet prison, his nine years in Israeli government, and his nine years as head of the Jewish agency. The book is called Never Alone, Prison, Politics, and My People. And those are some of the highlights from the Jewish year 2020. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to our L'Chaim Year in Review Roundtable. As always, I'm thrilled to be joined by a wonderful panel who will offer their take on the Jewish year of 2020. Which are the most important events of the year to each of them? And which will impact Jewish life of the future? And whom do they feel is the Jewish person of the year in 2020? 
let me introduce my panel to you. Stephen Bain is a social and political analyst, essayist, and lecturer in the Jewish community who served for four decades as the American Jewish Committee's Director of Contemporary Jewish Life and its Kuppelman Institute on American Jewish-Israel Relations. Eric Yaffe is one of the Jewish community's foremost liberal columnists and lecturers, whose op-ed pieces can be found at ericyaffe.com. Eric is also President Emeritus of the Union Reform Judaism, American Jewry's largest congregational organization, which he led from 1996 to 2012. Betty Ehrenberg is a veteran in Jewish organizational life, having served as executive director for the Institute for Public Affairs, the political action arm of the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America. Betty currently serves as the North American executive director of the World Jewish Congress. And Jonathan Tobin is one of American Jewry's leading conservative journalists and columnists, formerly the executive editor of Commentary Magazine. Jonathan now is editor in chief of the online news service, JNS.org, the Jewish News Syndicate. And I thank all of you for joining me for this year's L'Chaim Year in Review of 2020. Thank you for joining us. Good, good to be with you as always. Good to be with you as always too. Thank you. Nice to be here, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's lovely to have you now, Jonathan, on this year end panel, all of you. Just wonderful. All right, so the first question is the easiest. I'm gonna go one by one through uh, asking all of you, which event of 2020 do you consider to be the most important for the Jewish community of today and for the future? And Steve Baim, I wanna begin with you. What's your most important Jewish event? Well, this is a case where uh, what affects America affects, uh, affects American Jews. And the, uh, the COVID-19 virus has uh, transformed American society and transformed the Jewish community in innumerable ways. Uh, first, obviously, the, uh, the loss of life, which is um, enormous and unprecedented. More, more Americans have died due to the virus than uh, died in combat in World War II. Second, the impact upon the economy, the loss, loss of jobs. Thirdly, uh, what goes on in terms of the, uh, the schools, the academies, in terms of education, certainly in terms of Jewish education. Uh, fourthly, um, it's, it's transformed the way Jewish organizations do business. Uh, the very fact that we're meeting here uh, via Zoom as opposed to in your studio it speaks for itself. In some respects, that's been a blessing because it's uh, allowed, if you will, for a broader range of participants. Uh, Certainly, at, when I was at AJC, we, we, shift, we quickly moved to a Zoom flat platform, and it worked very, very well. Uh, last, uh, I must say, uh, with a great deal of sorrow, that uh, the virus also turned, to be, uh, turned out to be an embarrassment in the way that uh, large numbers of Jews, particularly in the ultra-Orthodox community, simply disregarded uh, the cautions and the restraints. And uh, that certainly embarrassed, embarrassed us all that... Uh, there's no greater mitzvah, if you will, than uh, the saving of lives. And the fact that that was disregarded in the most, among the most religious sectors of the community, I found particularly depressing. So um, much as I'd like to say some of the other incidents and events that took place were of greater significance, in terms of right now, the uh, COVID-19 virus basically trumps all else. Okay, thank you so much. Eric Yaffe, what's your most important event of the year? I'm going to agree with Steve, but focus in particular on the religious dimension. Uh, we are at heart a religious community. Our grassroots are organized around religious institutions. Our embrace of Torah and study of Torah is the foundation uh, uh, on which we uh, have been created, on which we will survive. And uh, what the virus did was call forth this enormous amount of creativity in adaptation among our religious institutions, which as I say, are the, are the grassroots of our community. I don't know necessarily we would have anticipated it, um, but uh, we saw in particular a technology 
that uh, allowed certainly in the non-Orthodox world for us to continue to worship and in fact to worship in even uh, more creative ways perhaps than in the past uh, for high holidays, for religious instruction. Um, our synagogues have created groups of every sort to meet the particular needs uh, the pains, the sorrows, the isolation uh, uh, of this uh, era. And uh, it's really quite overwhelming. Uh, I, I think it will have a long-term impact on, on how our religious world functions. Um, there will also be a downside, I think unquestionably so. I don't know that we focused on that perhaps as much as we should. Uh, we will lose some of the Jews on the margins uh, who have not been attending synagogue and perhaps uh, never will in, in uh, the future. But for the committed core, uh, I, I think it will be a plus. They will go back to the synagogue. Uh, of that, I'm certain. We haven't given up on the idea of sacred space. We haven't given up on the idea of a tactical, tactile Judaism, uh, Judaism of, of, of touch. Um, but uh, uh, have, having said that, we will experience some losses, but by and large, we will emerge from this, I believe, as a stronger religious uh, community than we were before. And all in all, I find it to be quite extraordinary and exceedingly encouraging. Okay. Betty Ehrenberg, what's your vote for? Uh, my vote is, it's a kind of a sad vote because... Um, First of all, all the things that you mentioned were equally monumental and I think all had profound effect on our community, each in their own ways. These are certainly the COVID, as my colleagues have said, although I would disagree with Steve and say that uh, um, <clears throat> one of the disappointing, one of the, the uplifting things about the COVID was the large amount of chesed that I've seen done or acts of kindness where Jews came out to help other Jews, young Jews in particular, helping Holocaust survivors and people who need elderly, people who needed help. Um, uh, I would not paint the entire ultra Orthodox community with one broad brush stroke. Uh, there were pockets of them uh, that were, were uh, not uh, following the rules because of their own uh, uh, from their own cultural uh, inclinations, uh, not specifically to just to flout rules. And it, it also was not characteristics uh, of the that entire community and all those different uh, Hasidic sects. I would say though that um, one of the things that I think if we're talking about profound influence, I would talk about the rise of anti-Semitism that hasn't stopped. It's the, the COVID has given birth to uh, conspiracy theories galore, but also an abundance, an overabundance of anti-Semitism, if you will, online, uh, all kinds of groups making accusations about the Jewish community. Uh, we see it in, in Twitter, we see it in Facebook, we see it in, in all the social media. And we've had to ramp up our communications with the social media platform leadership to make them aware of it. Um, it we saw it in the, in, in the intersectionality, uh, the rise in anti-Semitism. There was anti-Semitism uh, uh, coming from uh, the mem members, some members of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that uh, we could not uh, we cannot countenance, and that is something that we really have to work on very hard as a community. Um, uh, and I also feel, I was have to tell you that I was very encouraged after the Brooklyn Bridge March. It seemed that after that spate of attacks in Crown Heights, that spate of attacks uh, and other communities in Brooklyn and not only Crown Heights, but they were in Massachusetts, they were in California, they were in Queens, they were all over. Uh, the March of Solidarity with uh, many members of Jews, <clears throat> Jewish uh, organizations and groups of all stripes was very uplifting, but I don't think that it has lasted. I don't think that it has sustained, and um, I don't see seriously more unity in our community. I don't see it here. Uh, it manifested itself uh, uh, during the political campaign. It manifests itself still in Israel with all the fights. And uh, I think that's still a, a big challenge, if not maybe the greatest challenge for all of us. Thank you very much, Betty. 
All right, Jonathan, you're hitting cleanup. What's your response? Well, I think it's hard to argue against um, COVID and the pandemic as the most um, all encompassing world event of 2020. There's no doubt about that. And I'll just parenthetically say that um, I agree with Betty that um, the issue of Jewish unity is a crucial one. And I would, uh, I would augment what she said by saying that the one thing that 2020 proved to me was that Jewish unity is, um, is worse off. I think we, we were more divided than we ever have been before and are getting more divided. But if you're asking me to come up with something, single event, I'll uh, go off topic from the rest of my colleagues here and say the Abraham Accords and the um, normalization of uh, relations between Israel and four Islamic, four uh, Muslim states in um, the last few months, uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. Um, it was a culmination of a long process and a recognition of something that was already happening, but as a symbolic event, and also as um, something that is tachlis, something that's really happening. It has broken the back of the, the boycott of Israel. It has shown Israel to be not merely permanent, not merely, um, a strong uh, country and getting stronger, but I think it has really fundamentally changed Israel's place in the Middle East and the world in a way that even previous peace agreements didn't do quite in that same way. And um, I think it's shifted uh, even with the change of administrations and no doubt a change in orientation about Middle East policy. I think it has changed the discussion about Israel in uh, international forums, um, for all the problems, for all the anti-Semitism, I think this was a really crucial, uh, crucial development and uh, one that will long have, have, have an impact, um, especially as I think other uh, Arab and Muslim countries eventually join in it. Um, I think will have a tremendous long range impact on the Jewish state, on Zionism and the Jewish people. Well, I think all of you have made excellent points. It's interesting when I did my open, I began by saying everything should be seen through the prism of COVID-19. Obviously, COVID-19 has stopped the world. And since the Jewish community is part of that world, the Jewish community has stopped as well. I think you know, Steve, Eric, and Betty all made interesting observations about how they feel COVID-19 what, what the long-term effects of COVID-19 will be. I, and maybe at some point we, we should discuss that. To what extent do all of you agree, for example, that there will be different styles of Jewish life once COVID is finally over and there, everybody's vaccine has been vaccinated and there's herd immunity, will Jewish life look and feel different than it did in 2019 because of COVID or not. I'm one of those who is not convinced. I have the sense people are creatures of habit. And right now we're forced to live under certain limited circumstances. When those circumstances are lifted, I happen to think we will re re return to normal styles. And I do know that many synagogues, Eric, are hurting enormously because people are not paying dues with the idea that since they're not in the building, they're not getting their money's worth, which is disappointing to me as somebody in the Jewish community, that that's the way people would look at synagogue life and not understand that the synagogue needs to be supported, especially during time of COVID. I also am impressed by the way many synagogues have adapted using Zoom and other online ways of communicating and of holding services. And you all know I'm very proud of the fact that JBS televises both reform and Orthodox services every Shabbat morning, uh, evening and morning. And for many people, this is a lifeline for them Jewishly. But I am not as convinced as the first three of you that this will have a lasting effect that will change the way Jewish life is practiced. 
And what I, I mean, what I tried to say is we will look at everything through the prism of COVID. Now, once we do that, what's next? So Jonathan is the first one to say, as important as COVID is, and obviously it's the most important thing going on, in terms of the Jewish future and the Jewish world for him, it's the Abraham Accords. And that's my answer as well. If somebody said to me, what's the most significant Jewish event of 2020 that will have lasting impact? For me, it's a no brainer. It's the Abraham Accords. So what I wanna ask the first three of you is after COVID-19, Steve Bame, what is your next most important event of a Jewish nature in 2020? Well, first of all, just to uh, follow up for a second, Mark, um, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that, it's, that the impact of COVID-19 is permanent. I very much share your aspiration that we return to normal. What uh, overwhelms me in many ways simply though is the loss of life, which is irreparable, obviously irre irretrievable. Once you get past that, as you asked, my, you know, my second uh, priority, if you will, or my second choice, I, I didn't get to it or didn't, didn't bother listing it, I left, left that for others, was exactly what Jonathan said, uh, the Abraham Accords. Uh, now the question then becomes, why not Abraham Accords first? I think we need to applaud the Abraham Accords because they're steps towards normalization. That's something that Israel has sought from day one back in 1948. So any step towards normalization is to be applauded. Secondly, uh, I would not overlook the fact the, uh, the Abraham Accords um, saved Israel, if you will, from doing something that I do not believe would, be, would have been in her interests, namely annexation. In other words, the Abraham Accords took annexation off the table, at least for now. There's no sign of it coming back. And that's the second reason why uh, the Accords are a, a very, very positive step. My only caution is that the real existential issue regarding Israel is its future as a Jewish democratic state. And in that sense, the Palestinian problem is at the very center of it. There are those who have reacted to the Abraham Accords by saying the Palestinians are no longer center stage. The Arab states have lost patience with the Palestinians. I'd like to think the Abraham Accords really are a prod to the Palestinians to come back to the negotiating table and to see what can be done constructively to help their own society. My fear is that too many will say, we've given up on them. There's no hope there whatsoever. The best, the best route for Israel to take is to continue to cultivate relations elsewhere in the Arab world, where Israel has obviously enjoyed a good deal of success. So my hesitation with respect to the Abraham Accords really is to what extent will it shunt aside what I regard as Israel's fundamental existential dilemma, namely, can it continue to rule an occupation of some 4 million Palestinians? Very good. Jonathan, since you raised the Abraham Accords first, what's your response to the concerns Steve Bain expresses? Well, Steve is right. Um, the conflict with the Palestinians remains. Um, the problem, though, is that the Palestinians have consistently um, discredited themselves. They discredited themselves with the Israeli electorate for a long time now. Um, the three ele Israeli elections that were contested in the last uh, year and a half, last two years, um, war and peace issues, the Palestinians' territory, they weren't an issue anymore because there's a broad Israeli consensus that there is no peace process, there is no prospect for a peace process, that the Palestinian leadership, uh, the moderates, as well as uh, the Islamists of Hamas in, in Gaza, are not interested in a Palestinian state. They're, you know, they could have had one if they wanted one. Um, and indeed now the Arab states, the Gulf states who uh, have other priorities, um, they may pay lip service to the Palestinians, but they, um, they've given up on them. And they've given up on them for a good reason because they, they are not interested in progress. They had eight years of the Obama administration tilting the diplomatic playing field in their direction. John Kerry doing everything he could to coax them to negotiate seriously, and they wouldn't. Um, they prefer to be, the leadership of the Palestinians prefers to keep themselves locked and keep their people locked in a 100 year old war against Zionism. So at this point, it is a non-issue. Yes, it's, mm -hmm. it's still there, but um, it's been there for the last 50 years and no doubt it will remain, but Israel has shown that it is not going away. It is not collapsing 30 years ago, um, we were having this discussion, we said, well, 
by 30 years from now, if, if the solution, you know, if the problem isn't solved, Israel is, is sunk. Not only is Israel not sunk, it's gotten better, it's gotten stronger, richer. Um, so I, I, I'm not, as much as I don't disagree that it's an issue that eventually must be dealt with, um, it can't be dealt with by Israel by itself. Let me just, if I may, go back to COVID for just a minute and say that I think the impact of COVID will not be momentary. I think there are two key elements of our population that are not giving it up. You're right, Mark, some of us, uh, our generation maybe we're creatures of habit. Uh, we'll, go back to the, we'll go back to doing whatever it was that we were doing beforehand as soon as anybody lets us. Yes. But there are two, but the elderly will not. They have been scared. They, the fear that that has gotten into them about going about, about the, the fear of death and of contagion isn't going away so quickly. Even more to the point, Jewish children have been affected by this. Young children, teenagers, they don't have the same habits. They, their lives have been altered. They will carry around the fear of COVID, what it's like to live in a pandemic, the way my parents' generation carried around the depression with them for the rest of their lives. If anybody who thinks that's not gonna have a profound effect on the way Jewish institutions work, and in many ways, I think a profoundly negative effect. Um, we are a people that are built on community. You know, the old expression, you can't really be a good Jew on a desert island. Um, Zoom is great, we're using it now. There are a lot of, Rabbi Yaffe is very much to the point, and he's, he's right, there's been a lot of wonderful creativity and those who are committed are probably more committed. But, you know, it's not just marginal Jews. I think we have been living on desert islands and this is going to have a tremendous impact on rates of affiliation, on the way people relate to the community, I don't think we have even begun to scratch the surface of understanding that kind of impact, that, that kind of effect on the way Jewish life will continue. And um, it's gonna unfold. And I'm afraid most of the answers there are going to be negative. Okay. Eric, you can, if you want, you can re uh, respond to both of the points that Jonathan made. I mean, my real question for you was going to be, what's you know, your sense of the accords, but, one word on COVID. Go ahead. One, just one word because it's 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 a big topic. We have to focus on the difference between impact on small congregations and large congregations. That's kind of the central dynamic that's operating, I think, throughout the community. Uh, large congregations have the resources, the creativity, the skills that are required for this very difficult period. Uh, providing the uh, virtual religious experiences you know, for worship and for study and, and uh, for social gatherings and cultural events and so on um, is a difficult thing to do. It requires um, uh, technological know-how and it requires money. And uh, large congregations have been extraordinary. Small congregations have suffered. Sometimes they don't have the skills Sometimes the rabbis are simply unable to do it with the, the best of, in, uh, of intentions. And very often they simply don't have the resources. Uh, what you do is interesting. Um, Central Synagogue is this extraordinary congregation and community uh, with wonderful rabbis and a uh, religious, um, you know, a Shabbat experience mm -hmm. that is soaring. There's just simply no other word. It's just soaring. So what's happened? People throughout America, <laughs> thanks to you and to others, are, um, uh, are davening for, for uh, Shabbat, if their religious beliefs permit this, um, you know, via Zoom at Central Synagogue. But what about their own synagogues, which are simply unable to provide what they're providing? So the long-term implications of how that plays out is distressing. We can't simply be a, be a, a, a movement, a, a, a a national community where we have large uh, uh, synagogue centers and not the smaller communities that have, that have always been the, the heart of American Judaism. Okay, Mo but I just wanna say this. First of all, I continue to say it again. 
I believe that after COVID, although Jonathan made a very good point, especially having to do with children, and it occurred, has occurred to me as well, Jonathan, that the analogy is with those who experience the depression. Um, but I'm still counting on most of American Jewry returning to patterns that preceded COVID. Now, what I'm interested also, Eric, hearing from you is, you heard some concern about the Palestinians being left out of the Abraham Accords. Yeah. And a concern again that we've talked about over and over again, all of us here uh, in, on one form or another have talked together on JBS about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the goal of maintaining a Jewish and democratic state of Israel. Does the issue of the Abraham Accords to you in any way pose a threat to a Jewish democratic Israel? On balance, no. Uh, look, the, the Abraham Accords are a, a wonderful, significant, positive development. It seems to me no sane person can oppose them. <laughs> And uh, th this notion that we are going to have in a, in a variety of places, day-to-day uh, -day contact between Israelis and, and citizens of, of a major Arab country is a, a tremendously important development. And you create a, a, a culture of normalization uh, that ultimately lends permanence uh, to the peace arrangements that have been established. Obviously, we need to be cautious here uh, nothing is, is by definition permanent. We remember that Morocco had uh, diplomatic relations with Israel before, at least on a certain level, and then they were broken off at the point of the second intifada. So we, we have to be aware of that dimension as well. Overall, though, I, I embrace these accords, and I, I think, you know, again, everybody needs to see how positive they are. I also believe, to, to respond to your point, they are likely to help uh, the Palestinians, uh, help the plight of the Palestinians. Yes. If there is any possibility of moving forward, it seems to me those possibilities are greater now than they were in the past. Yes. And wh why is that? Uh, first of all, because the Israelis have entered into a deal with Arab countries, which means those Arab countries now get a say in what happens moving forward. So you had very clear condition that there was to be no annexation. Uh, very clear. So it'd be interesting if Bennett or Starr becomes prime minister, they both talked about annexation, but Israel uh, made a commitment together with the United States that annexation was not going to happen. So they were going to be, I believe, constrained by that. Um, the, the other thing is the Palestinians themselves seeing this reality. In fact, we're just news reports today in Israel. I don't know if others have seen them, although uh, you know, this has been clear now for over the course of the last week or so, have said that they want to go back into talks with the Biden administration, renew contacts, and see what they can do to start moving towards some kind of arrangement. In other words, they recognize that in light of this, they perhaps have to, to move to, to get off that spot that Jonathan talked about where they have been for a very long time, unwilling uh, uh, you know, to, to embrace any kind of uh, diplomatic process that would be helpful uh, to them. So, um, I, I, look, nobody's expecting that there's going to be a deal with the Palestinians tomorrow. I believe the Abraham Accords makes it more likely, however, that we could see some progress in that regard over the course of the next uh, year or two. Okay. So, Betty, I want you to chime in. How important to you were the Abraham Accords? And, and do you want to say anything to what you've heard from Steve or Eric or Jonathan? I think they're very important. I think there were, uh, uh, I mean, it's really hard to kind of prioritize all the events that you mentioned as the major event. These are all big major events that have happened this year. And uh, it, it does, uh, the Abraham Accords raise the security of Israel. They raise the prestige of Israel. They raise, um, uh, uh, in the, in the international community, they raise the importance of Israel, as we see. Uh, and I think that um, uh, you mentioned two other things that I think are also major. Uh, and I would say the taking out of Suleiman and of Farizadeh 
which has to do very much with the Abraham Accords that finally uh, Arab countries in the Gulf, uh, Arab countries uh, in North Africa are beginning to realize that Israel and they have a common enemy that um, they'll have to rely on Israel because of the strength that she has and the values that she uh, upholds and that I have more to learn about that too. But I think these countries are going to rely more and more on Israel for regional stability, which is, I think, more important than anything. I don't think we have stars in our eyes about, I mean, I'm hearing these very starry-eyed expressions about um, um, Yitzhak and, and Yishmael and, and Sarah and Hagar. I don't think that's what this is about. I think what this is about is uh, uh, neighbors in the region, uh, the, the, finally, the realization that Israel is in the Middle East to stay. It's not supposed to be on another planet and it's not made up of foreign implants. And uh, it, it, it is going to be a stalwart uh, uh, colleague for uh, its neighbors that, who will need to rely on Israel and be partners with Israel. And that's where I think this is going. And that's why I think um, they are so important. It will be wonderful to have the cultural exchange and the educational exchanges and to see uh, uh, both peoples thrive, the tourism develop and bloom. I heard, I heard already amazing numbers. Um, uh, and if all that results in more and more people-to-people -people understanding and cooperation, matov. But if it re if it is able to bring stability uh, in the face of a rogue state that refuses to the, one of them that refuses to uh, uh, countenance uh, stability in the interests of its own hegemony, then. Um, then I think uh, that that is really the major achievement. By the way, Betty, how much credit do you give Donald Trump for the Abraham Accords? I give him a lot of credit. He gave, you know, he enabled uh, uh, the, the, his representative, the representatives of his administration uh, to um, go with, to run with this. He gave the green light to run with this and, and go ahead with it and um, see where it would lead. And it is, um, and I think it, it was very daring uh, and I think it was very courageous. So I do give credit. Eric, how much credit do you give Trump for the Abraham Accords? It happened on his watch, he gets the credit. Okay. Eric, that is really cool. <laughs> Steve Bain, what do you say? Um. Look, uh, the, the record on Donald Trump will not rest upon the Abraham Accords. I said at the very beginning, when he actually launched his peace plan, I said too many in the Jewish community dismiss anything that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth as, uh, as heresy or, or worse. So in that respect, uh, yes, he deserves credit. Uh, however, the overall assessment of him, uh, frankly, in my mind remains that uh, he did a lot of very good things for Israel, but he legitimated hatred, he increased the polarization within American society, and that is very, very bad for Jews. Okay, it's so interesting. I didn't ask you that question. I didn't, I didn't ask you, what do you, how do you feel about Donald Trump and was he a good president? I asked you, does he get credit for the Abraham Accords, but you couldn't resist. It's so interesting. Jonathan, what's your answer to the same question? Well, I think obviously he does. I think he deserves credit and his foreign policy team of you know, ex-real estate uh, entrepreneurs and, and amateurs deserve credit because they rejected the conventional wisdom about the Middle East that has been sold to us by the foreign policy establishment and uh, generations of peace processors. Um, they really turned everything upside down that involved the decision on Jerusalem and a host of other issues. And they changed the culture. Um, you know, it's, it's going viral. There's a video of John Kerry in 2016 saying, no, 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 it's a hard reality. Something like this can never happen. Um, it happened because there was a difference there because, because quite frankly, um, Trump and his foreign policy team, and I would give you know, more credit to his foreign policy team, give a little credit to Jared Kushner um, and, uh, and the other guys than Trump himself who just presided 
um, because they had a very transactional approach to foreign policy in a way that uh, say John Kerry had a more messianic approach to foreign policy and about what he thought he could achieve. They all, his predecessors all thought they could cut the Gordian knot. Uh, Kushner and company thought they could achieve what was possible and they therefore achieved so much more. Yeah, by the way, Jonathan, you do remember people ridiculed the idea that Donald Trump and Jared Kushner and David Friedman and Jason Greenblatt could ever be successful. In Not just people, I made fun of Jared Kushner <laughs> three years ago. I'll, I'll take credit for it. I mean, I still, I still tend to refer to him as White House, senior White House advisor slash presidential son-in-law. And yet um, I, I give him more than full credit. I, I give him the credit uh, for doing something that all of his predecessors failed to do. Okay. I want to move on then to what I consider to be a related topic. I would like to you to I would like to hear all of you speak to the to the issue of the 2020 presidential elections and what impact you think that's going to have on Jewish life and on the relationship between Israel and the state of Israel, uh, and the United States. And we've discussed this already, but in the context of a year in review, first of all, now we know for sure that Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States. Are any of you concerned about the future of the Israel-US relationship? And it obviously is going to be have a different tone than the relationship under Donald Trump. But what's your sense of this, Eric? I'm not concerned, not concerned at all. Um, my view is uh, Biden is a good friend of Israel for a half a century. Uh, we've seen it uh, uh, again and again. I think it's something he feels sincerely. He expresses with uh, eloquence. Uh, he has put together a uh, solid centrist team, all these fears that some, you know, the left wing fringe was going to take over the, uh, the uh, you know, the administration and uh, direct the foreign policy. I think none of that uh, has actually happened. I, I think he will be uh, modest in his approach because he has domestic issues that he must confront immediately. The American people demand that uh, appropriately uh, so. He's not going to be looking for any major breakthroughs. I think he'll make some uh, adjustments. I mean, he'll he'll encourage some contact with the Palestinians. Uh, he'll restore some aid. He'll probably open an office, Palestinian office, in in Washington. But but by and large, he'll have a domestic focus, but pro-Israel with a good pro-Israel team. And I think um, he will do a lot also to restore and build upon the two-party consensus and support of Israel that American Jews have promoted for half a century and that Donald Trump did everything that, that, that he could to, to undermine in my, in, in my view. You know, the line that uh, only we Republicans care about Israel, which was something that we heard from Trump uh, in one way or another over the course of the last four years, I think was not helpful to Israel's cause or to, to Zionist ideals. Uh, I think uh, uh, Biden will rebalance that, and I'm not concerned at all. Okay. Anybody disagree with Eric or have anything else to say? I think the, um, I don't disagree that there is a huge potential for conflict. Um, I think he's, he's right that uh, Biden has appointed a very conventional um, team of Obama alumni but who may be chastened by the Obama administration's failures and will not go back down the road of trying to achieve more daylight uh, between the two countries, which was President Obama's um, you know, a goal. I, I think blaming uh, Trump and the Republicans for making uh, support for Israel less bipartisan is looking at the problem through the wrong end of the telescope. The problem isn't that Trump was so pro-Israel. The problem is, is that the Democrats are divided on Israel. Um, part of the Democratic Party, uh, and its activist base, which is appears to be locked out of power in Washington, ha is very questionable about Israel. And it's sort of the way that the Republican Party used to be divided on Israel, you know, 50 or 60 years ago. Um, it's now sort of the lockstep pro-Israel party. Um, if Biden can restore bipartisan support for Israel, 
by avoiding conflict with Israel, by not looking to gin up uh, disputes um, as, as you know, every time that there's some disagreement, uh, not using, if he keeps to his promise to disagree in private rather than in public, that will be helpful. But you know, in terms of what is the future for Israel, um, I'm not worried about Israel because Israel has shown it can say no to the United States if it, if it thinks the United States is wrong. Um, yeah, that that's it's a plain fact. Israel is not as 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 dependent as much as Israel needs American support. It doesn't need to say yes to every whim of an American president. And uh, I hope um, President Biden will understand that. I hope he doesn't uh, go down the road of appeasing Iran again. That's that's a problem he needs to address. He needs to build on what Trump did, just as he needs to build on what Trump achieved. Um, in terms of Middle East peace and the Abraham Accords, um, but we'll see. I'm, I'm, I don't have a great record in predicting how presidents do. I, I thought Obama wouldn't. Uh, there wouldn't be much conflict between Obama, you know, and Israel when he became president, and that didn't work out. So we'll see. Okay. Just want to pick up on one thing here, which is uh, that uh, I think in this this uh, just this past administration now it's past we we're quite spoiled. We got uh, used to. Uh, a tenor coming out of an administration regarding Israel that we haven't been used to. Um, I wouldn't, and I, I don't feel that um, uh, it is so black and white or so obvious that one party is just so pro-Israel and the other party is, is not, it's not really the truth. I think uh, Jonathan is right, the, the Democratic Party is divided and uh, support for Israel is uh, uh, that we got into the Democratic Party platform this year was really hard won, but it was won. Um, and uh, division in the, or, or a lack of support in the Republican Party was not 50, 60 years ago because I'm remembering James Baker and that wasn't 50 years, 60 years ago. And that was uh, also difficult. And I think what we, st we still have to re realize that we still have this big job because support for Israel in Congress is always hard won. It's always hard won. It's always a lot of work. And it will continue to demand that work of us. And we will still have to continue to, uh, to uh, uh, rely on the uh, security relationship. Well, I'm talking about the Pentagon and Israel, mil military to military, the security issues, and the fact that um, uh, the United States sees in Israel a very important strategic asset in that region. And I think that is really going to um, uh, help keep things on an even keel. I think things will remain on an even keel, but the political can affect it. And uh, we're going to have to um, still reinforce the security aspects of this okay. relationship. Betty, you alluded to the fact that you had to work hard, the Jewish community had to work hard to get certain things into the democratic platform. Like what? Well, it was uh, taking out, in other words, not conditioning aid to Israel. Uh, on uh, what happens with the Palestinians. That's very important, not conditioning aid to Israel. And was there a move at one point to have that as part of the democratic platform? Yes, there was. And uh, you, know, we ha you have now different voices in the Democratic Party. Uh, they're vocal. Um, uh, they didn't win this round. Um, their letters to uh, the, their colleagues, their dear colleague letters that are pro-BDS uh, or more pro-Palestinian don't get, garner a lot of signatures, but don't underestimate their popularity on the ground. They have a lot of grassroots popularity. So we're going to have to keep uh, our, we have to be vigilant. What about okay. the right though? I mean, let's, let's, I, you know, it's, we have to deal with anti-Semitism wherever Absolutely. we see it. Absolutely. Oh, Eric, I don't disagree with that at all. We have to watch it. We have to watch it. It's never going to go away. And we always, I mean, I have seen uh, it come up again. Lyndon LaRouche groups, which I had thought went under, are now out again. It's always. No one, I think we should not politicize anti-Semitism. It is terrible from wherever it comes from. And right. You have to watch it and fight it. Wherever it, it wherever it uh, emanates from, it's 
it, this is not a blame game here. Your anti-Semitism is more lethal than, than their anti-Semitism. That's crazy. Anti-Semitism is lethal from what, no matter its source. And uh, I think we, we have, uh, I'm not, I don't feel uh, uh, tranquil, not as a result of Abraham Accords, not as a result of this election, not when we eventually will have a vaccine. I am not so sure about how the world will be changed. I am praying with all, with all of you that, that the world will be changed for the better for Israel, for the Jewish people, for Jews in America who have seen this uh, wonderful country as home for already now so many years. But I'm not sure where all of this is gonna come down. I have no well, crystal. look, I'm 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 simply I'm agreeing with you. I'm simply saying we take on anti-Semitism wherever we find it. We fight against anti-Israel feeling wherever we see it. Uh, it exists on the left. And we talk on this program a good deal about those manifestations on the left. It exists on the right as well. What about QAnon? What about Marjorie Taylor Greene? What about the attacks on Soros? What about the, you know, the white supremacists and the violent nationalist uh, right, the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys? What about Douglas McGregor in the Pentagon, who's a Trump appointee? You know, all, all of this is part of the picture as well. And we have to take it on wherever it exists. Steve Bame, I want your comment. I guess, uh, you know, in working four decades in public Jewish life, one thing I learned is that uh, Jewish leaders, the best of them, and certainly everyone on this panel, but we still have a problem of, uh, we tend to tell ourselves the narrative of uh, it's hard to be a Jew. In other words, the story we tell our own people, the story we tell ourselves is that in one form or another, the world is falling apart. And here I, I really dissent a bit from really both, both Eric and, uh, and Betty, not that they're wrong in terms of the facts on the ground, but the picture is, I think is much larger. First of all, as far as Biden is concerned, Eric, I think, put it, put it very, very well. Short term, but the, the relationship between America and Israel transcends party politics. It's in danger of becoming partisan. But my, my assumption is, is that Biden coming from where he's coming from will do everything possible to restore closeness between America and Israel. If nothing else, the popular basis of pro-Israel support in this country is much higher than you would think when you speak to Jews, where we think that uh, Israel is the, uh, uh, the pariah state when uh, 60, 70% of Americans clearly favor Israel over the Palestinians. So in that sense, short term, I don't think there's all that much to worry about. As far as anti-Semitism is concerned, um, number one, you did, re you did reference the, uh, uh, the rally in, in February of Jewish unity. And I agree with what's been said that uh, that unity has been frayed over the course of the last 10 months. But the reality is, is that again, Americans and certainly American leadership are vigorously opposed to anti-Semitism. It doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't exist, but in that respect, uh, we, 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 live, we live in this country in a far better shape, that no society in diaspora Jewish history has been as receptive to Jewish participation as has the United States. Now, if all we can tell ourselves is that it's hard to be a Jew and the people hate us, then think about the impact of that. Uh, Jewish unity should be based upon love of Judaic heritage, love of the Jewish people, what we share in common in terms of Jewish values. If the only basis of unity uh, is that we have too many enemies out there, the question is, what, what would that unity be worth anyway? So my point to, is uh, to give it a, long, a, short, um, a short summary of, of everything I'm trying to say here is that there are grounds for concern those, cons those grounds should be caught carefully monitored in the years ahead. In terms of the Democratic Party, it's almost generational. Namely, the old guard is very vigorously pro-Israel. I'm not so sure at all about the younger people, certainly not in terms of the uh, progressive left. And that has to be guarded against. Secondly, we need to ensure an America that remains open, pluralistic, receptive to Jewish participation. And that American pluralism goes back a long way. It, perhaps has, has often been uh, a challenge, both on the extreme of the right and on the extreme of the left. But America's weathered those challenges very well. If you want to talk about anti-Semitism, perhaps the more, more encouraging thing is that a, when we met a year ago in the aftermath of the Hanukkah party in Muncie, we thought that was a harbinger of everything to come. And there were good reasons to think so. Yes. The more, the more encouraging thing of the last tw 12 months is we haven't seen anything like that since. Yes. I'd like to jump in. Um, 
I, I don't disagree with uh, Steve about um, anti-Semitism and trying to look at the big picture. Um, by and large, America is a philo-Semitic country. I mean, we can add up all the anti-Semitic incidents. We can schreigewalt. Some of our organizations schreigewalt for a living. Many journalists schreigewalt for a living. Um, but I think uh, American Jewry, um, I believe in American exceptionalism and anti-Semitism is the proof of it. Even at the worst of times, uh, anti-Semitism is a marginal phenomenon. Yes, it, it, it exists on the right as well as the left. It must be confronted everywhere. But on the whole, I think the majority of the American, the vast majority of American people are with us. Where I'm concerned is not so much that they're coming to get us and the lack of you know, external enemies will, will destroy Jewish unity. Um, we're living in a context of uh, an America which has um, dissolved into a pair of tribal, uh, you know, into a tribal war, a tribal culture war, where politics has replaced religion for most people, where there is just tremendous um, distrust and even hatred between the two political sides. We saw how that worked out in the campaign. And that has affected the Jewish community as well. I think one of the troubling trends in which it relates to the talk about that unity parade a year ago, in that you know, the, uh, the, 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 the minority of American Jews who voted for Trump, uh, the small number of political conservatives, but mostly the, the Orthodox community, which is more pro-Trump than any other part of the community, um, I think that has, has fed into um, a lot of the backlash about COVID and some of the scapegoating of uh, the Orthodox community. Uh, I think the, uh, the, un the willingness of, of much of, of the American Jewish community to buy into the, uh, the attacks on, on, on the ultra-Orthodox, who, although there's certainly sectors of them um, did uh, violate um, some of the COVID rules, but there are many other sectors of American life uh, that did the same. And uh, I, I think they were singled out in a way that was unfair. And um, I, I'm deeply troubled about the way our Jewish community is locked into left and right um, and um, sort of staring angrily at each other in the way that all of American society has been doing that increasingly. We, we listen, wa uh, listen, watch, read different media and uh, come to different conclusions about everything. Um, don't talk to each other. Uh, social media has created this, this atmosphere in which you, you cancel, uh, you delete, you unfriend anybody who disagrees with you. I think that play, that's, that's gotten worse and that got a lot worse in 2020. Um, it increased the invective um, both within the political parties and within the Jewish community as well. And I think that's something that we have to continue to monitor and address. Um, there's no easy solution to it because as I said, politics has replaced religion for many Americans. And um, I think that has had a, a negative impact on the Jewish community, on its ability to work together. And I think um, these, two, these two ships passing in the night, um, you know, Rabbi Yaffe made an interesting point early on in this program where he spoke about how the core is getting stronger I think in general, the core, the Jewish core of all the movements of all the denominations have gotten stronger, but um, that's a smaller ship compared to the, especially in the non-Orthodox world, to the much larger ship passing in the other direction that has gotten less Jewish, less interested in Jewish topics. And uh, these, these are all factors that, um, you know, I'm very optimistic about Israel's future. I'm, I'm not that, I'm not as optimistic about American Jewry's future. I have to say, I'm a, just a touch surprised that this panel seems to suggest that the change from a Trump administration to a Biden administration really isn't terribly significant, not for American Jewry, nor for the Israel-American relationship. Um, you know, we've heard for four years, people say how terrible Donald Trump's policies were. I'm um, the vast majority of American Jewry, they don't dislike Donald Trump. They loathe Donald Trump, loathe him. And you know, we're doing a program on JBS dealing with Barack Obama's recent autobiography, Promised Land. 
And Barack Obama has a chapter on Israel. My own comment has been there are a lot of things about the book that are very lo lovely. And, and by the way, 1.7 million people, 1.7 million people bought the book either in hard copy or online, whatever, in the first week. There's never been a book like that. But if Barack Obama writes a, pair, a chapter about Israel that distorts or, or has serious omissions, it seems to me to be appropriate for me and for other guests on JBS to point those omissions or distortions out without it being a referendum on either Obama or on Trump. But I'm getting e emails from people who say to me, why are you going after Obama? And don't you understand how terrible Trump is? And then a whole series of invectives about who he is. And it ends by saying to me, why aren't you a nice person? As if a nice person would not raise issues about how Obama characterizes the history of the state of Israel, where the only, the only mention of the Temple Mount is that it's important to Muslims that the PLO was basically came to power after the Six Day War, not before. That there was no League of Nations that created the state of Israel through the mandate system. These are not small things. These are major errors in a chapter describing the emergence of the state of Israel. And my point is this, there has been a very strong feeling within the, within the American Jewish community really on both sides that says there has been a difference in terms of the way the Trump administration dealt with Israel and how it moved the embassy and it ultimately acknowledged or recognized the Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And ultimately it created now, you know, it pulled out of the Iran deal. It stopped payments to the Palestinians for pay for slay. And then at one point, it creates the Abraham Accords. And it's viewed as administration that says to the Palestinians, come to the table. By the way, the Palestinians were invited to be part of the Abraham Accords. They chose not to be. Trump, the Trump plan included them. In fact, it began with a $50 billion infusion to the Palestinian economy if they would be part of the deal. At the same time, there are those who've said, we can't have Trump's philosophy. And that what we need is a Biden philosophy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and the state of Israel, which doesn't rubber stamp anything Netanyahu wants to do. And there's going to be a difference if the Obama administration ethic is now implemented through a Biden administration. So I'm surprised that none of the four of you seem to say one of the significant things that has happened in 2020 is that because of COVID, Trump is out and Biden is in, as if we just won't miss a beat. So I'm asking you again, if anybody wants to in some way comment on how you feel, it will be significantly oh. different, not di significantly different for the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Uh, Mark, there is, um, you know, there, there is obviously a fine line here that, uh, you know, that will change. The Trump administration went out of its way repeatedly to say basically no daylight between America and Israel. That to me was an unrealistic proposition that in the best of days, George W. Bush, um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, in, all the, in all the days since 67, there have always been some level of daylight our job as American Jewish leaders has been to try to minimize that daylight. But zero daylight was an unrealistic proposition pre-Trump. Along comes Biden. You can expect, I think, more of the issues of, of contention, issues of disagreement, 
However, it'll be in the context that's disagreement between friends and faithful allies. If Biden departs from that, which I don't see him as doing, then we really have a problem. But short of that, I'd say we can manage a Biden administration as well as we managed, say, George W. Bush or Bill Clinton. Okay, and just out of curiosity, do you expect that to be true in a Biden administration? You know, it's this daylight business, it always amuses me. There's, ne there's always been factually some daylight between the US and Israel. You know, everybody's, one of the questions people ask me about Trump is, why does he like Israel? What is it about him? You know, you know let's dive into the, the, uh, the psyche of Donald Trump, which is, I would say, a very dangerous exercise. And I don't know that I want to do that. I don't know that anybody can really make sense there. But the point is, his actions, his team um, did take, as I said before, a transactional view of it. Um, they were realistic about the Palestinians in a way that Barack Obama, uh, Hillary Clinton, and John Kerry never were, were seemingly incapable of being. And, um, and therefore uh, dealt with the world as it was rather than magical think of, thinking about the way they wanted the world to be. Okay, aren't you worried that to some extent this philosophy will be part of the Biden administration. I'm, I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm not concerned. It certainly is a possibility. Um, but I think uh, Anthony Blinken um, and even Joe Biden himself, who has often lectured, is he's the kind of a friend who, of Israel who likes to lecture Israel, tell him what they think. That's, that's, that's his nature. He's on the one hand a very charming man, but he's also very opinion, opinionated. Um, I think there's a possibility for conflict. Um, there's a, you know, we also don't know who's going to be the prime minister of, of Israel for two years. You know, maybe Netanyahu's right and he's immortal. He will be prime minister forever. Um, maybe not. That will be part of the dynamic. Um, but the point is, I find it hard to believe that a president saddled with the kind of economic catastrophe that the United States is in at the time with the COVID problem still not solved with uh, all these other things in front of him, that he, if the idea that he is going to look to Israel, look to the Iran issue as his main focus, I doubt it. Um, I might be wrong. I think it would be terribly, terribly foolish for him to try to undo, um, you know, part of the problem is you say, you know, the transition from Trump to Biden. Yes, in some ways it's very, it's stark, but, that's that's assuming that Biden would just sort of wish away everything that Trump did and that it will just all disappear and we'll go back to where we were in January in 2017. I don't think that's, I, I not only do I think that would be a terrible thing to do, I don't think it's possible. And okay. I think that's why you're sensing from us the idea that this might not be the existential problem. You know, the whole problem with the American election this year was uh, something that you know um, Michael Anton wrote about it uh, four years ago about Republicans, a Flight 93 election, where people think they're on a plane that's about to crash or be you know, taken over by hijackers. And you know, the world is about to end. I think this year, both Democrats and Republicans uh, spent this campaign acting like the world was about to end. I think a lot of Democrats thought if Trump is reelected, the, the, the Republic is over. I think a lot of Republicans still think that, you know, that there are Trump supporters who think it is the end of the world. Yeah. Um, it isn't the end of the world. That's the yeah. thing about democracy. Um, Good for you. Life goes on. Good for and, you. And uh, I think we have to we have to keep that in mind. Okay, Eric, is there anything inappropriate about JBS dealing with Barack Obama's chapter on Israel simply to correct the factual errors or omissions in that chapter? No. I, I, look, I am concerned about this sort of obsessive anti-Obama feeling uh, that we sometimes find uh, on the American right. I'm not suggesting you're necessarily <laughs> reflecting that, but I want to uh, put that out there as a, a concern. We have every right to analyze the policies of the Obama administration to indicate where we think they're right and where we think that they're wrong. But there seems to me to be a, a, a deep dislike of Obama that somehow just goes beyond this, this task of analysis. And it, it 
concerns me. So I'm sharing that with you and I, I hope it'll be kept in mind as you do your work. It's so interesting. The answer should have been, of course not. Of <laughs> course not. Somebody writes a chapter about Israel, it's factually wrong. Doesn't matter who it is. Except because it's part of Barack, my, part of my problem minute, is because, because it's Barack Obama, it has a credibility, which if some nobody wrote the exact same things about Israel, it wouldn't matter nearly as much. And I'm, I, you know, I just wanted you to say, of, of, of course not. Of course, JBS should deal with any major book. And You're right. And the answer to the question of. Or do you have the right? Do you have the duty to comment on it? Yes, you're right. The answer is, of course you do. However, the reason why it has become a political issue, the reason why people are attacking you for taking Obama's name in vain and for daring to question him is that we are in this kind of, in this bifurcated political culture. Absolutely. You know, if you're on one side, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to criticize my heroes. Okay. You know, and that means if you're, you know, for some people on the left, don't dare criticize Obama. And if you're on the right, there are plenty of people who are saying, don't dare Look, criticize Trump. And that's, uh, that's unhealthy no matter where it goes. Mark, I, that's that, that is, I, that is I, really I, the I, essence I, of this. That, and we've been talking about this, that we have been marinating in such a political uh, soup of, um, of d divisiveness and, and screaming at each other, Jews screaming against to Jews. Uh, and we're not looking, and that politics has displaced religion in many circles, and that's really true. And people would rather scream at each other than talk to each other. People would rather people. It's the same thing, and it does reflect what's been going on in the United States. That I mean, how? Why are we reading about people afraid to come to Thanksgiving dinner with family members unless there is this written rule not to discuss politics? Uh, because we get into these fights and people just don't let go. And what happens is there's just name calling and it's reflected. This has become the way our society has been operating. And that's what's the matter. That's what's at the root of this problem. There is, a, you, you, know, you can disagree with someone on, on Twitter and all of a sudden give it two, two sentences and people are into name calling each other the worst names in the world. There is no, civility has fallen away to a large degree. I have seen this, uh, this kind of fight, this, these political fights, uh, Jewish right against the Jewish left screaming at each other. And I've watched the comments go back and forth on the emails for an hour and a half. Until you say to somebody, why don't you stop this already? You have been screaming at each other for an hour and a half. In an hour and a half, you could have taken the time, you could have written half a dozen talking points that would help Jewish kids on campus deal with whatever BDS or, so, or other, what other issue they have to deal with. You've wasted an hour and a half screaming at each other and instead of uh, trying to address the problem of anti-Semitism and the people who hate us all. And this is really what's the matter. We've lost sight of, of a civility in debate, a civility in, in discourse. And, and this is a, this intolerance of one another in our own, amongst our own people that we cannot afford. We cannot afford it. This, this is, uh, this, we've done this before. I've seen it during the time of the Naman Commission and people screaming at each other from all the different movements so that when you'd walk into the NACRAC or to the president's conference, you, the, the esprit de corps was wounded. You couldn't talk to anybody. This is terrible. I, I saw it after the, after the Rabin assassination. This was terrible. Uh, one of the ways we tried to address it, and Steve, you could quell, was uh, AJC, Diane Steiner, my colleague at AJC, tried to make a, uh, a, a dial intra-religious dialogue uh, through the religious women leaders of all the streams. And we began to talk and we lasted for a good two, three years talking because nobody understood one another. It was the first time people wanted to sit down and understand what is a reformed Jew? What is, a, what is an Orthodox Jew? What is a Lubavitcher? What is someone who goes to or is a Rua on the East side? Is really, uh, uh, we have, we're just okay. melting. Okay. And that's why you are being vilified for doing what you should be doing as a journalist, which is uh, fact checking. Okay. Anyway, what I love about all for you is that even when you disagree, it's always done with great respect and with civility. And it's something I'm committed to very 
profoundly here at JBS. All four of you have been wonderful in part one. We will begin to prepare for part two. It is my pleasure to be speaking to Steve Bame, Betty Ehrenberg, Jonathan Tobin, and Eric Yaffe as they assess some of the most important events of this past Jewish year, 2020. And I hope you'll join us for part two of our discussion when we'll also hear their picks for who is their Jewish person of the year. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me at rabbigolub at jbstv.org, or you can write me at Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. And please remember, you can now take L'Chaim with you anywhere you go and listen to it on the L'Chaim podcast. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. L'Chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.